good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you for coming, and thank you for Side Effects for inviting me to speak for you again. I'm really excited to be here to present to you at FMX on behalf of Framesaw and, of course, Side Effects. Um, so, my name is Ahmed Garaf, and I'm one of the heads of CG uh, at Framesaw in London. Um, and today, I'm going to talk to you through some of the creature work that we've done in the department and explain how we've used Houdini to solve some of the challenges that we face along the way. The last talk I did on this subject was quite broad. Uh, it was a big overview of creature work in general, touching on FEM and muscles and all sorts. I thought today I'd try to hone in on one subject, and I've um, chosen groom and, and fur. Um, but before all of that, I'll start uh, by telling you a little bit about the department that I work in. Uh, and the type of work w that we do. Let's kick off by watching our latest company showreel. Very good, thank you very much. Um, so historically, we were mainly a commercials department producing some really iconic ads uh, over the years. Um, but over the last kind of two or three years, our department has changed and evolved. We've grown exponentially both in size and in the offerings that we, that, that we deliver. Currently, we're at around 130, 140 artists in our um, London office and there's no real sign of a slowing down in growth. Um, we're taking on bigger and more ambitious projects, especially within our television and immersive offerings. Um, so in Framestore, we call our department Framestore Integrated Advertising, or IA for short. To be honest, it's not a name that really describes well what we do. It's, it doesn't mean anything to me. Uh, but as we often call ourselves the non-film department although we have also produced work for films. Um, so it, it's, you know, it's a little bit confusing. Uh, actually, most recently, we, we took on um, the opening sequence for the Detective Pikachu movie. Um, we supervised the shoot all the way through to animation and effects and shot execution and compositing. So, you know, we do a bit of everything. Um, television. Framesaw has a long history of working in television, actually, uh, going all the way back to Walking with Dinosaurs. I don't know if any of you have seen it. I, I, I know I grew up watching that on, on TV. And at the time, it was incredibly groundbreaking. Um, now, with the advent of, um, let's call it prestige TV, uh, the small screen is no longer seen as the poorer relation to the silver screen. Shows like Game of Thrones have certainly paved the way for big budget television series, allowing us to create some incredibly high quality visual effects for some really en engaging shows. Um, so we've, we've now worked on the last season, uh, last three seasons of Black Mirror, 
Um, th this, this clip here is uh, from a new show called Curfew. It's for Sky Television. All the VFX were done in Houdini, of course. Um, we've also worked on Mars, seasons one and two, uh, The Terror, One Strange Rock. Um, we're working on a new show called The Boys for Amazon Prime, which I'm really excited about. The Witcher for Netflix, C for Apple TV, the list goes on. Um, we're also working on some really cool shows, which I'm not allowed to talk about just yet. Maybe next time. Um, we still obviously do advertising. It's, it's still a big part of our offerings. And I'm really proud of the high quality output our artists are able to produce with ever-shrinking budgets and schedules. Working, working in commercials forces you to work smart. It, work, it forces you to work smarter and faster. Because clients expect the same quality of work that they see on big budget movies at a fraction of the cost. Um, and you're also given a chance to work on some really crazy and imaginative scripts, like, like this one that we're looking at here, um, which we recently did for Money Supermarket, and it has a, a parachuting cat. Let's, let's just look at her one more time. There she is. Brilliant. Um, now, immersive is a really interesting and exciting facet of our department. Uh, we get to do things like design and build theme park rides all over the world, where we're working for companies like Disney, Universal, Lionsgate, um, and as well as producing content for cutting-edge VR and AR technology. Um, I'm going to share with you now a, a short reel of a project that we recently delivered for Air New Zealand. It's using Magic Leap to, to create this multi-user augmented reality board game. It's, it's super cool. Um, just, just watch. So the game that we've developed is called Air New Zealand Fact or Fantasy. It's a great way to showcase both the airline and the destination and get people excited about what there is to do in New Zealand. Welcome to the most incredible country in the world. What we wanted to do was reinvent the traditional board game. The travel quiz game and it comprised of the digital world augmented with a physical game board. Nobody else has done that. So we had to figure out how that was going to work. What Magic Leap have designed is essentially a portable head-mounted solution that gives you the illusion that the objects that you're seeing are actually integrated into the real world. My name's Pete. One of the challenges was producing something that was going to be visually coherent, given it had physical and digital, so we needed a common aesthetic. The team was spread. Magic Leap in the States, that was the technology partner, Air New Zealand in Auckland, and Human Dynamo, who were the model maker in Wellington, and Framestore in London, who were doing the digital development. Framestore make digital images for nine different platforms, as well as virtual reality and augmented reality headsets. We had the ability to be able to sort of ring fence where the creative had to sit to maximise the platform and the Air New Zealand team, you know, filled that really creatively. The excitement of doing something that nobody else has done, that just keeps you motivated and it keeps you fired up. This is really just the start for us. At Air New Zealand we're always curious, we're always looking at new ways of engaging with customers and that's often through new technology. We're really excited about the opportunity as to where this technology could take us. Jordan. How, how cool was that? Um, we, we had the actual board game after we delivered it in the office and people can just put on the headset and you, you, know, you, you see the, the helicopters flying around and all of this. It's so cool. Um, anyway, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's safe to say that we've got such a wide gamut of different types of work flowing through our frame store, not film department. Um, and our artists are free to, to work within any of these disciplines. They, they kind of float around. Um, and because of that, you'll be hard-pressed to find a dull moment in the department. Um, I, I think that's probably enough self-promotion for now. Um, now, on to our main topic. So, at Framesaw, we're extremely passionate about creature work. Uh, and we take our work very seriously. 
Here you can see a picture of uh, Grant Walker, my co-head of CG, enjoying himself hanging out with a baby reindeer for scientific purposes, of course. Um, all right, so let's, let's go through the motions of what I think are important steps to take when embarking on th this type of work in CG. <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago, our head of animation, uh, Ross Burgers, he was, he was writing his own presentation. Uh, he sits in the same office as me, uh, and he came up with this uh, acronym which I thought was too clever and too silly not to share with you today. Uh, we were in the office and he turned around to me and he said, Ahmed, I've got it. It's all about the cow. The most important thing you need to consider when starting any new project is the cow. After a confused silence, we both burst out laughing and then he went on to explain his cow. Um, so C is for clarity. You want to get as much clarity about all aspects of the project before starting. What is the brief? Uh, is it photoreal or stylized? Uh, are you going to be doing close-ups or is it mostly mid uh, to distant shots? Who are you working for? Who is your client? Uh, have they done CG work before? Um, that, that could have a big impact on the approval process. For example, uh, if your client doesn't understand CG, maybe they, they don't understand what a grayscale turntable is or blocking animation or previs. You know, you, you have to be prepared to, to explain and ed educate them along, along the way through that process. So clarity, ask lots of questions before you start and, and get them answered early on before you start any expensive CG build. O is for observe. Do your research. Get out and study your subject. Uh, what, one thing that I personally love about the work that we do is that we get, to, we get a chance to... To, to become mini experts about all sorts of weird and wonderful things. Um, and, and we often speak with esper, experts within their fields to collaborate with. Uh, we, we collaborate with professors in evolutionary bi biomechanics and paleontology. Their, their years of experience can feed directly into how we choose to build or animate our creatures. I cannot stress enough how important reference is. And for anyone who knows me personally, you're probably sick of hearing me talking about reference, but reference, reference, reference. And finally, W is for workflow. It's important for everyone in, in the production chain to consider their workflow. Work smart, get sign off before you move on. Establish a schedule that you and your clients can stick to. Um, Aim for a determined approval process. For example, in the case of animation, uh, get sign off on your previs before you start blocking animation. Get sign off on your blocking before you start primary animation, and get sign off on your primary before you start your secondary. You know, it's it, uh, it's it's terribly important to establish this workflow and and for everyone to stick stick to it. And if you do, uh, you're going to have a good time. Now. Let's talk about some creatures and how we've put them together using Houdini. Um, over a year ago, we delivered this project for a Sony A7 camera, where we were tasked with creating a herd of black wildebeest. We had just got our hands on Houdini 16.5 at the time, which had some really nice updates uh, with the groom tool set. So we were pretty excited about this one. Grant, who you saw earlier hanging out with the baby reindeer, was tasked with creating this groom. This was his first time using Houdini, so it's, it's fair to say it was an interesting challenge. Um, still, he produced an excellent groom without major issues. Um, for all intents and purposes, it's a relatively simple groom. Most of the fur is shortly cropped along the body without too much clumping or variation. Um, Actually, at some stages of production, the, the groom did have some clumping and frizz and uh, you know, fur sticking up like this and all this. I, I think it's, it's kind of a, it's a natural thing that people do when, when they first start grooming, uh, playing around with the tools. Um, but actually, in this instance, um, in the case of the wildebeest, the, the fur on the body has very little to almost no imperfection. So we, we stripped all of that out. Um, you know, the, the longer fur along the, the neck and the face and the tail 
proved to be a bit more challenging, of course, but it was nothing that we couldn't handle. So for this groom, we more or less followed the convention set by the grooming tutorials from side effects, um, paint lots of different maps with masks that then drive a load of different uh, guide process nodes which manipulate the fur, uh, all the while keeping the deformations on the fur live and procedural, and then at the very end, um, go in there and start doing some manual combing for some finishing touches. We were pretty happy with the result, so much so that uh, to show it off internally, we, we had Willy the Wildebeest running through a CG set inspired by some stage design from the Eurovision Song Contest. All right, from wildebeest onto sheep. Um, we created this sheep for this zany, cool ad uh, that we delivered for IKEA. Was it IKEA? Either way, it was a fun commercial which has a wicked soundtrack, uh, which I'll share with you later today. Uh, it's, it, it features our sheep at the very end of the commercial for this weird, uh, surreal crescendo. The schedule was incredibly tight, um, and in the end, we spent just over two weeks uh, on, on the groom alone. Ideally, we'd want much, much more time, but we, we pulled it off. Um, so, since grooming the wildebeest, we've established a slightly different way of grooming in the department. Um, starting by using curve flows to initialize the overall direction and flow of the groom, we then start by planting guides hand by hand, the same way someone who creates wigs, for example, would place each hair by hand, or so, someone who works at Madame Tussauds. Uh, they plant each hair one by one, manually sculpting and combing all along the way. We do the same. Luckily for us, though, after planting a few guides, Houdini helps us along the way and interpolates between the different guides so we don't have to manipulate and shape too much. Um, it's a slightly destructive workflow, to be sure. Um, you know, it's, it goes against the ethos of proceduralism and whatnot, but, um, and even hitting undo when, when you're doing that doesn't always do what you want it to do. Uh, but at this early stage of grooming, it allows for a level of detail and control and fidelity, which, uh, in my opinion, would take much longer to achieve procedurally through painting maps and whatnot. So we groom one side of um, the creature and then mirror it over. The uh, same tried and tested technique uh, that modelers have been using for many years to create their geometry. Uh, we also try to break it up into different sections. In this example, the, the body was groomed separately to the head, which was groomed separately to the legs and, and so on. We can then add more guides in the areas uh, where flow and direction changes dr dramatically and where the groom needs more to, to be more considered, such as around the eyes and acro uh, across the face in general. We, of course, still paint and generate the maps, um, which we then use to drive all the guide processing nodes. Uh, here, here are some of the maps that we generated for the sheep. Uh, the black and white one that you see right at the end that, that looks like a zebra. I really like that one because we, we use that to, to part the fur. Um, generally, when you get really thick fur, you get lots of kind of huge, huge clumps, let's call them, and you get these kind of lines that, that part along. And it was really successful in the case of the sheep. Um, speaking of clumping, clumps and subclumps are a really important thing to get right in order to achieve a realistic look. Um, here you can see a close-up of, uh, of some fur, which demonstrates the idea of clumps within clumps within clumps, um, with you know, the, the red lines showing the larger shaped clumps, giving you the overall shape, the blue lines showing the subclumps within that, and then the green ones, and so on and so forth. This diagram here shows an example of a basic subclump structure which you can use and recreate in Houdini. Uh, the idea is to use multiple hair gens to create subclumped hairs, 
and feed them in as, uh, as guides for larger clump structures. So the density for each hair gen dictates the clump size and the level of detail that you get from the clump. Additional noises and variations and, uh, and that kind of thing on, on top of that, of course, help to, to break it up uh, and add some extra uh, details. Um, but th doing this allows for a huge level of control on how each clump is shaped and the size of them and, and how they look. And you can see this demonstrated here in the sheep groom. Uh, so you have one level of guides and then another one with less density. Um, and this is a considered level of density which dictates the size of the clumps that we wanted. Oh, sorry. Uh, and then that drives the hair clumps of our first set of guides. So now you've got one level of clumping. Um, now, this new clump set of guides is then used to clump our mainstream of the groom. So you've got a clump within a clump within a clump. Uh, and then using those maps and masks that we saw earlier, uh, we then further deform and tweak until, the, uh, and, until we've got a, a groom that we're happy with. Uh, here's a work in progress render of the sheep's head. Um, this is about halfway through the schedule. The groom for the sheep was certainly challenging, and, and not just because of the tight deadline. Thick woolly fur is notoriously difficult to get right in CG. Ma maneuvering the multiple levels of clumping, plus uh, variations for each subclump, and then some serious curling and twisting on top of that, we, we eventually landed on a result which w we think is quite successful. Here's one of, uh, uh, I don't know if it's final or close to final, one, one of the final turntable renders of the sheep. Um, you, you can see here that we often make the skin a really bright color for review purposes. Um, this allows us to easily see where there might be holes in the groom or some density issues, uh, and you can just pick your favorite color. And here's the final thing. Candy-colored clown, they call the Sandman. Tiptoes to my room every night. Just to sprinkle stardust and to whisper, go to sleep. Everything is all right. I close my eyes. Like, like I said, there's a cr crazy, zany advert. I, I really like it. Um, all right, now back to some reindeer. Um, this is actually one of my favorite renders uh, through, throughout the production. I, I always go back to, I just, I, I love the lighting and everything. It was really cool. Um, I've, I've talked about this project at length before in my previous presentation. So I'll try to avoid going over the same stuff because, you know, Everyone wants to see something new, right? Um, it's good to note that that same technique that I just described for grooming the sheep is exactly how we created our reindeer. Uh, sculpting and shaping guides to get very specific shapes, uh, like on the forehead here, there was a, a, a star in one of the reference pictures that the director really liked, and we, we, we sculpted that right into the face. Um, and then, obviously, multiple layers of clumping and subclumping. <clears throat> this turntable was rendered relatively early on in the project, way before we started any CFX um, or creating multiple variations of the six different reindeer. We also created the Digi Double Santa uh, with a big fluffy white beard. Um, we, we did consider putting some fur on his costume as well along the white trim, but um, 
he was small enough in screen and we, we, we managed to, to achieve the look just using some clever shading and displacement that we, we didn't need to, but the, the beard we did groom. <clears throat> so the, the, guide, the guides for Santa's beard were combed in three steps, essentially. Uh, first, the main guides were blocked out following big shapes and flows uh, that closely matched the reference pictures of the real Santa. Uh, the second pass had the guides split into different groups, and then each of these groups was sculpted and improved on separately. Finally, subclumps were generated for each of these sections. Then some additional uh, combing right at the end uh, for, for kind of further refinement and, and getting the shape just so. We had two streams of guide curves going into our hair gen, uh, one for the defined shapes and curls, and another one for the more messy and, and frizzy hair uh, to, to, to fill in the gaps. Of course, all the while, we're constantly comparing our CG groom to that of the real, the real one. Reference, reference, reference. And one more time, here's the final ad. Sorry, guys, no carrots again. Too, you know. Thank you very much. Um, all right, last up is a commercial that we delivered a few months ago for the Sunday Times, which is a, a newspaper back in the UK. Um, it was directed in-house by one of our creative directors, William Bartlett, and it features a whole mix of live action animals and CG ones. Uh, and they're all sitting in a full CG environment of the Houses of Parliament. Same with IKEA, the, the schedule was incredibly tight and, and, and the team did a, a stellar job to deliver this in, in uh, just mere weeks. So, one of those animals in the Houses of Parliament is a black bear. Um, we managed to turn around this asset in record time, from grooming through to texturing, all the way to, down to look dev and rendering. Uh, this render that we're looking at here took a little over two, uh, sorry, a little over four weeks' time to achieve. Um, of course, the learnings and tools and techniques we did developed uh, on all the previous characters that, that you've seen today, all of that fed into creating this bear. And that's what's allowed us to get to such a nice result uh, relatively quickly. And, you know, the, the next creature that we create is going to be even quicker and more refined and so on and so forth. Here's one of our um, earlier renders for internal comments of, and approval. Of course, as always, observing and comparing to real photography. Some close-up details, looking at some pores and how the fur flows along the hand and, and the forearms. Again, grooming in exactly the same technique of manually sculpting and placing guides to get to the exact shape that we want. 
Um, some ar areas are combed asymmetrically, especially around the face and underneath the body. Um, this was also the first project where we used our new custom hair gen node that we've been developing at, at Framesaw. Um, it gave us a much better result of the interpolation from guides into the final groom, but I'll, I'll get back to that later. Can you see that? Oh, I can't see it. Um, if, if you could see this, what we're looking at here is uh, it's, it's essentially uh, occlusion baked onto the geometry. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to, to give a big shout out to Matt Estella and his CG Wiki website. If, if you've not been on it, you're missing out. There's, there's loads of really cool stuff on there. Uh, it's full of incredibly useful tips and tricks for uh, and anything that you can think of in Houdini. And one of those is an occlusion shop, uh, sop. It's incredibly handy for generating organic maps on creatures. So in this instance, we were using that occlusion sop uh, to drive a procedural dirt setup on, on the fur. Just about see that a little bit better. Um, so using the seclusion top, we're able to generate quickly and quite realistically, I think, where dirt would naturally ac accumulate on a creature. So ar around the, uh, you know, armpits and around the, the thighs and, you know, uh, it, it gives you a very nice result very quickly and very easily. Uh, we then generate some procedural geometry in Houdini uh, to simulate bits of dirt and twigs and sticks and that kind of thing, and then we scatter those onto the fur using that occlusion mask that we've created. Um, and, and here's the final ad. If we could talk to the animals, just imagine it. What a neat achievement that would be. If I conferred with our furry friends, man to animal, think of the amazing repartee. If I could talk to the animals, learn their languages, maybe take an animal degree. If I could walk with the animals, talk with the animals, grunt and squeak and squawk with the animals. And they could talk to me. So that's our bear. Um, finally, I'd like to show you some of the custom tools that we've been developing at Framesaw. While, of course, we love Houdini and the native tool sets that it comes with, Nothing is perfect, and there's always room for improvement. Uh, so we've now dedicated time and resources into uh, internal R&D for creating custom tools and workflows. One of those is our own custom hair gen, uh, which now gives us some really nice features that we were missing in the default one. One of the issues with the native hair gen is that you often get guides having unwanted influence through thin objects, uh, such as guides you know, on, the, on one side of the ear influencing fur on, on the other side of the ear. Where before, to, to get around that kind of thing, you'd paint influence masks to, to avoid this issue. We no longer have to worry about that. Um, in my kind of layman's understanding of how this custom node works, uh, it does this by working over the entirety of the surface of the geometry rather than looking at where it is in, in world space. The results are much more predictable for the artists, uh, allowing us to use much fewer guides to control the final groom. Now, I'm, I'm really fond of our um, new hair deformer. The, the conventional workflow in Houdini um, is... You know, to, to deform your fur is that you, you plug your simulated guides into a hair gen, uh, which then, as, as far as I know, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it generates a groom for each frame based on the inputted uh, deforming guides. To me, this workflow is slow and cumbersome, and, and it means that our lighters, uh, they have to have the latest hair gens from our groom artists in their scenes, and doing that, things can get really messy really easily. 
Uh, for the reindeers, one thing I, I really struggled with was trying to establish a, a clean workflow from first simulations uh, into lighting and rendering. How I see best the workflow is that our CFX artists would simulate the fur using any amount of guides that they require to, to achieve the sim that they need. And then they publish those simulated guides. Uh, and in lighting, they simply pull in those animated curves. They pull in a static groom. They deform the static groom with the animated guides. And, and, and you have your, you know, you've got your creature moving around with the fur moving around in, in a natural and convincing way. Our custom hair deformer does exactly this. After developing it, we went back and ran some tests on our reindeer, because uh, we only just recently uh, kind of fully developed it. Uh, and where before the capture stage, where um, you know, the, the full groom and the animated guides are told which curves should deform which and by how much, um, this step on the reindeer, um, it, it took us 20 hours to capture the groom. Now, with our custom deformer, we've taken it down to about five minutes. The same way that our hair gen gives better interpolation from our guides, our hair deformer better matches the deformation of the simulated curves, uh, reducing artifacts without the need to spend time painting radius maps, plus a reduction in RAM and disk space due to far fewer guides needed to capture uh, for our deformation. I really can't wait to, to use this in production, and I'll, I'll, be shared, uh, I'll be sure to share it with you next time. Um, and then finally, we're developing a brand new feather system. Using the native Houdini Groom toolset, uh, we piggyback onto that to create our feathers. Our feather tool that we're developing uses the same Houdini uh, ethos and principles, which are now very well established in Vellum and in their groom tools, where you have three inputs in and three inputs out. Uh, so it just, it just looks like native Houdini tools. So the learning curve for any artist who already knows the tools is extremely easy uh, and can get started creating feathers really quickly in no time. I, I really love this video. It's, it's so hypnotic to watch. Uh, what, what we're actually seeing here is one of the stages of, of the grooming process. We use vellum to solve the stacking of the feathers. Um, so, you know, you, you, you get proper feather on feather on feather stacking with, w without too much, you know, still a work in progress, but it looks really cool either way. Um, and so far, we're getting some really promising results. I'm afraid that's it from me today. Uh, of course, everything that we've looked at here is a massive team effort by a lot of really extremely talented artists back at Framesaw. Uh, but I'd like to give a special shout out to, to these guys up here on the screen. Um, and as always, we're looking out for talented artists to join our team. So please drop us an email or come find me at the Framesaw booth later on today or tomorrow if you'd like to have a chat. Thank you very much. Anybody have any questions? Simon. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for this beautiful presentation. It was super interesting. Thank you for sticking um, around. Yeah, I have, I have actually two questions. So the first one would be, you mentioned that you place all your guides by hand. Mm -hmm. I can understand why you do that. Um, what about the guides for the clumping? Is it like a certain percentage of your already placed yes. guides? Yes. So, so the, the, the first process is you're, you're, you're planting as many um, kind of uh, the, the first step. You, you're planting as many guides as you want. As I mentioned, around the eyes and whatnot, you can add a lot more to get exactly the right shape. Around the body, you can just, you know, very sparsely uh, uh, plant them along. Once you've got a shape that you're happy with, then you just create another hair gen off of that to, to create your, your sub clump. So you, you put down a hair gen, that hair gen, or our custom hair gen. Um, you, you decide how many uh, uh, fur, how much fur that you need, and then another one, and then you use that for, for your clumps, and then you sub clumps. All right. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes sense. So the second part would be about the maps that you use. So. Mm -hmm. um, 
I mean, there's always two ways. One is that you paint the masks as point attributes on the points, and the mm. second one is to use textures. And I recognized I, I don't do that much fur, but sometimes a little bit, that especially the maps for hair thickness look mm. much better uh, when I have like textures. Um, you're, you're probably right. Uh, we we have painted them directly with textures, you know, UVs and UDIMs and, and whatnot, but we, we generally just paint directly on the geometry. All right. um, our, our models are relatively high res, certainly the ones that are used for deformations at the end, so there's usually enough um, resolution on the geometry to, to yeah, allow maybe us to... Maybe that's to the key to just have enough points. <laughs> yeah, just just have more verts. All right, cool. Mm. Thank you very much. Other questions over here? Uh, hi, Gabriel here. Thank you for the presentation. Hello. It was really cool. Um, I have a question uh, concerning um, dynamic clumping. Okay. So, uh, is it based on collision, or do you also use the SOP uh, methodology? So, when when you have the the surface which is deforming, and then uh, the folds generate, is it that the fur collides and then the the clumps get, or do uh, you, you, you you mean the you mean the separation in the in the thick fur? Yes, because if a cheetah runs mm. and uh, the, the, the 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 muscle underneath uh, the, the, the yes, forms the surface. Yes, no, you you you're absolutely right. Um, I'd I'd love to say that it's really clever and it's based on skin folds because that is how it's done in real life and maybe one day we'll be able to achieve that. But for now, we just we just paint it in. We just say, in this reference picture, we're seeing lines here. Let's just paint some lines here. Okay, cool. And mm. another question, because uh, I, I'm an action user and I hate it. And I'm <laughs> <laughs> as, um, you have to uh, work with PTEX. And I know that in Houdini you can get uh, the information on, from the points when mm -hmm. you g g give the color attributes to the points. Is that how you generate the color for the shading in Houdini? Or how did you, how did you get the color? Um, for, for our renders, you mean? Yeah, no, for the indiv individual's plants, for the individual... I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I've, for I've, the individual I'm hair. So, because you can, you, if you get a map, you can say, okay, this area is this color, this area so is the, color. So, the, the, you're talking about the final render, you might have yeah. some, some yeah. brown fur and then some white fur sticking yes. through it. Yes, Right, okay. So, we, we, we create, um, let's call it a library of different fur. So, for the reindeer, it, uh, you know, we look at it and we go, right, there's brown fur, there's gray fur, there's white fur, and maybe like something in between. We create these shaders, and then in the groom, uh, we paint um, color attributes on, 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 on the skin, which then transfers into the fur kind of where we want. So around the muzzle, it will be white. That then goes into gray. Um, and then using those maps, we assign ID attributes to the fur. Uh, and we, we clamp those at some points, with, uh, so you still get some variations. And or then color jitter in between, and then... Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then we, uh, using those attributes, then the, the fur knows which shader to pull in. Cool. Thanks. Other questions? Come on, one, one more. Anything. There's no dumb questions. We're all good. Going once, going twice, okay. Well, thank you, Ahmed. Thank you very much.